Welcome to the Mobile Money Nation. My name is AJ. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. Given the current climate of civil uprising due to the recent deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, amongst many more in the past captured via video, audio, even the ones we don't hear about on the national news, I wanted to take some time to share a historical perspective on the treatment of minorities in this country, especially those of black Americans. Many times you may hear from white friends, family, strangers, co-workers, etc. that they are open to educating themselves on the matter, and we all need education. So here are eight of some of the best books I could find discussing race, poverty, and wealth in America. Because my platform is used to discuss finances, the books I've chosen skew towards the financial impacts of social injustice in America stemming from 1619, when the first slaves arrived, up to now with mass incarceration. You can think of this as the start of an eight month book club, which starts on the last Friday of this month and ending on the last Friday of January, 2021, leading into Black History Month. So if you've made it this far, I already commend you and let's get started with our first book. So our first book will be The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. This book was originally published in 1970 and it's 192 pages long. Description. Dedicated to the oppressed and based on his own experience, helping Brazilian adults to read and write, Freire includes a detailed Marxist class analysis in his exploration of the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. In the book, Freire calls traditional pedagogy the banking model of education because it treats the student as an empty vessel to be filled with knowledge like a piggy bank. He argues that the pedagogy should instead treat the learner as a co-creator of knowledge. So what's the definition of pedagogy? Pedagogy, most commonly understood as the approach to teaching, refers to the theory and practice of learning and how this process influences and is influenced by the social, political, and psychological development of learners. Pedagogy, taken as an academic discipline, is the study of how knowledge and skills are imparted in an educational context and it considers the interactions that take place during learning, both the theory and practice of pedagogy very greatly as they reflect different social, political, and cultural contexts. Since we will all learn from this moment in time, as well as from the next eight months as we dive into America's financial history and how race and social injustice ties in with that for this set of books, I wanna first have a foundation of what teaching means. I'm not here necessarily to teach you or to fill your empty bank as Paulo would describe. We are learning from each other and teaching each other along the way. So book number two, which will be our July reading, is The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism by Edward Baptist. This book was originally published in 2014. It's 498 pages long, and it covers a timeline between 1619 and 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. Description. Americans tend to cast slavery as a pre-modern institution, the nation's original sin, perhaps, but isolated in time and divorced from America's later success. But to do so robs the millions who suffered in bondage of their full legacy. As historian Edward Baptist reveals in The Half Has Never Been Told, the expansion of slavery in the first eight decades after American independence drove the evolution and modernization of the United States. In the span of a single lifetime, the South grew from a narrow coastal strip of worn out tobacco plantations to a continental cotton empire, and the United States grew into a modern industrial and capitalist economy. Until the Civil War, Baptist explains, the most important American economic innovations were ways to make slavery ever more profitable. Through forced migration and torture, slave owners extracted continual increases in efficiency from enslaved African Americans. Thus, the United States seized control of the world market for cotton, the key raw material for the Industrial Revolution, and became a wealthy nation with global influence. Told through intimate slave narratives, plantation records, newspapers, and the words of politicians, entrepreneurs, and escaped slaves, the half has never been told offers a radical new interpretation of American history. It forces readers to reckon with the violence at the root of American supremacy, but also with the survival and resistance that brought about slavery's end and created a culture that sustains America's deepest dreams of freedom. 
The next book is The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap by Marissa Baradarin. This book was published in 2017 and it covers a timeline between 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation up until the present. This book is 371 pages long. Description. When the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863, the black community owned less than 1% of the United States total wealth. More than 150 years later, that number has barely budged. The Color of Money pursues the persistence of this racial wealth gap by focusing on the generators of wealth in the black community, black banks. Studying these institutions over time, Marissa Baradarin challenges the myth that black communities could ever accumulate wealth in a segregated economy. Instead, housing segregation, racism, and Jim Crow credit policies created an inescapable but hard to detect economic trap for black communities and their banks. The catch-22 of black banking is that the very institutions needed to help communities escape the deep poverty caused by discrimination and segregation inevitably became victims of that same poverty. Not only could black banks not control the black dollar, but due to the dynamics of bank depositing and lending, but they drained black capital into white banks, leaving the black economy with the scraps. Baradaran challenges the long-standing notion that black banking and community self-help is the solution to the racial wealth gap. These initiatives have functioned as a potent political decoy to avoid more fundamental reforms and racial redress. Examining the fruits of past policies and the operation of banking in a segregated economy, she makes clear that only bolder, more realistic views of banking's relation to black communities will end the cycle of poverty and promote black wealth. Our next book for September is Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II by Douglas Blackman. This book was originally published in 2008 and it's 468 pages long. And the timeline of the book runs from 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation up to World War II in the 1940s. Description. In this groundbreaking historical expose, Douglas A. Blackman brings to light one of the most shameful chapters in American history, an age of neo-slavery that thrived from the aftermath of the Civil War through the dawn of World War II. Under laws enacted specifically to intimidate blacks, tens of thousands of African Americans were arbitrarily arrested, hit with outrageous fines, and charged for the cost of their own arrest. With no means to pay these ostensible debts, prisoners were sold as forced laborers to coal mines, lumber camps, brickyards, railroads, quarries, and farm plantations. Thousands of other African Americans were simply seized by Southern landowners and compelled into years of involuntary servitude. Government officials leased falsely imprisoned blacks to small town entrepreneurs, provincial farmers, and dozens of corporations, including U.S. Steel, looking for cheap and abundant labor. Armies of quote-unquote free black men labored without compensation, were repeatedly bought and sold, and were forced through beatings and physical torture to do the bidding of white masters for decades after the official abolition of American slavery. The neo-slavery system exploited legal loopholes and federal policies that discouraged prosecution of whites for continuing to hold black workers against their wills. As it poured millions of dollars into Southern government treasuries, the new slavery also became a key instrument in the terrorization of African Americans seeking full participation in the U.S. political system. Based on a vast record of original documents and personal narratives, slavery by another name unearths the lost stories of slaves and their descendants who journeyed into freedom after the Emancipation Proclamation and then back into the shadow of involuntary servitude. It also reveals the stories of those who fought unsuccessfully against the reemergence of human labor trafficking, the modern companies that profited most from neo-slavery, and the system's final demise in the 1940s, partly due to fears of enemy propaganda about American racial abuse at the beginning of World War II. Slavery by Another Name is a moving, sobering account of a little-known crime against African Americans and the insidious legacy of racism that reverberates today. Our October reading is The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. This book was originally published in 2017 and is 368 pages long. The timeline for this book is between 1920 and 1968. 
In this groundbreaking history of the modern American metropolis, Richard Rothstein, a leading authority on housing policy, explodes the myth that America's cities came to be racially divided through de facto segregation. That is, through individual prejudices, income differences, or the actions of private institutions like banks and real estate agencies. Rather, the color of law incontrovertibly makes clear that it was de jure segregation, the laws and policy decisions passed by local, state, and federal governments that actually promoted the discriminatory patterns that continue to this day. Through extraordinary revelations and extensive research that ta Coates has lauded as brilliant, Rothstein comes to chronicle nothing less than an untold story that begins in the 1920s, showing how this process of de jure segregation began with explicit racial zoning as millions of African Americans moved in a great historical migration from the South to the North. As Jane Jacobs established in her classic, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, it was the deeply flawed urban planning of the 1950s that created many of the impoverished neighborhoods we know. Now, Rothstein expands our understanding of this history, showing how government policies led to the creation of officially segregated public housing and the demolition of previously integrated neighborhoods. While urban areas rapidly deteriorated, the great American suburbanization of the post-World War II years was spurred on by federal subsidies for builders on the condition that no homes be sold to African Americans. Finally, Rothstein shows how police and prosecutors brutally upheld these standards by supporting violent resistance to black families in white neighborhoods. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibited future discrimination but did nothing to reverse residential patterns that had become deeply embedded. Yet, recent outbursts of violence in cities like Baltimore, Ferguson, and Minneapolis show us precisely how the legacy of these earlier eras contributes to persistent racial unrest. The American landscape will never look the same to readers of this important book, says Sherilyn Ifill, president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. As Rothstein's invaluable examination shows that only by relearning this history can we finally pave the way for the nation to remedy its unconstitutional past. Our November book will be Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Home Ownership by Kianga Yamada Taylor. This book was published in 2019, it's 368 pages long and covers the time period between 1968 and 1979. Description, by the late 1960s and early 1970s, Reeling from a wave of urban uprisings, politicians finally worked to end the practice of redlining. Reasoning that the turbulence could be calmed by turning black city dwellers into homeowners, they passed the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968 and set about establishing policies to induce mortgage lenders and the real estate industry to treat black home buyers equally. The disaster that ensued revealed that racist exclusions had not been eradicated, but rather transmuted into a new phenomenon of predatory inclusion. Race for Profit uncovers how exploitative real estate practices continued well after housing discrimination was banned. The same racist structures and individuals remain intact after redlining's end, and close relationships between regulators and the industry created incentives to ignore improprieties. Meanwhile, new policies meant to encourage low-income home ownership created new methods to exploit black homeowners. The federal government guaranteed urban mortgages in an attempt to overcome resistance to lending to black buyers, as if unprofitability, rather than racism, was the cause of housing segregation. Bankers, investors, and real estate agents took advantage of the perverse incentives, targeting the black women most likely to fail to keep up their home payments and slip into foreclosure, multiplying their profits. As a result, by the end of the 1970s, the nation's first programs to encourage black home ownership ended with tens of thousands of foreclosures in black communities across the country. The push to uplift black home ownership had descended into a gold mine for realtors, mortgage lenders, and a ready-made cudgel for the champions of deregulation to wield against government intervention of any kind. Narrating the story of a sea change in housing policy and its dire impact on African Americans, Race for Profit reveals how the urban core was transformed into a new frontier of cynical extraction. Our December book will be How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America, Problems in Race, Political Economy, and Society by Manning Marable. Originally published in 1983, it's 372 pages long, and it covers a time period between the late 1960s up to the 1980s.
Description. Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America is a classic study of the intersection of racism and class in the United States. It has become a standard text for courses in American politics and history and has been central to the education of thousands of political activists since the 1980s. This edition is presented with a new foreword by Leigh Mullings. Manning Marable offers profound insight into the deeply intertwined problems of race and class in the United States historically and today. How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America dispenses impeccably comprehensive research to expose the realities of African-American poverty, health, employment, and education, as well as other demographics. Marable's conclusions prove an undeniable connection between the oppression and exploitation of Black America and capitalism. And our eighth book, which will be our January read, is The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. This book originally published in 2010, it is 290 pages long, and it covers the time period of Jim Crow between 1870 and the 1960s, as well as the new Jim Crow time period from the 1960s to the present. Description. Jarvius Cotton's great-great-grandfather could not vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by the Ku Klux Klan for attempting to vote. His grandfather was prevented from voting by Klan intimidation. His father was barred by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Cotton cannot vote because he, like many black men in the United States, has been labeled a felon and is currently on parole. As the United States celebrates the nation's triumph over race with the election of Barack Obama, the majority of young black men in major American cities are locked behind bars or have been labeled felons for life. Although Jim Crow laws have been wiped off the books, an astounding percentage of the African-American community remains trapped in a subordinate status, much like grandparents before them. In this incisive critique, former litigator turned legal scholar Michelle Alexander provocatively argues that we have not ended racial caste in America. We have simply redesigned it. Alexander shows that by targeting black men and decimating communities of color, the U.S. criminal justice system functions as a contemporary system of racial control, even as it formally adheres to the principle of colorblindness. The new Jim Crow challenges the civil rights community and all of us to place mass incarceration at the forefront of a new movement for racial justice in America. The upcoming book selections are not just heavy topics, but also deep and even long from a number of pages perspective. The order of the book selection is based on the timeline the books cover. All of these books are available via Amazon, and if you use the Goodreads app, you can keep track of them there or create a list in your favorite app. I recommend, if available, to use your local library. Some of these books may not be available, but you can request for your library to purchase them so that you can read them for free. Be sure to request all of them now unless you plan to purchase them. It's not a bad list to have in your personal library if you do choose to purchase them. I have links in the description for these individual book selections, and I've also dedicated a section of my website for this book list, which I'll have a link for as well. If you do use my links, I will receive a commission for book purchases, full disclosure, if you make them on Amazon via the links that I provide on my website. I will also have links to more general anti-racism books in the description, not just ones centered around finance, so check those out as well if you would like to create your own list. On the last Friday of each month, I will post a summary and some of the main quotes or points or points of interest that I got out of the book when I read it. And so any of you that are following and if you happen to read the book as well, be sure to watch those videos, leave comments either on this video or on the individual videos that I will have upcoming so that we can talk about the book. And maybe I'll even create an official book club to where maybe we can actually talk in person about these books and about these issues if you would like. So if that's something that you would be interested in, make sure you leave comments below and let me know and I'll see how we can set that up. And if you have any suggestions for any platforms we could use uh, specifically for that, of course, leave those suggestions in the description as well. And again, if you've made it this far, I really appreciate you watching this video. Thanks for taking this time out of your day. If you're not already part of the Mobile Money Nation, all you have to do is hit the subscribe button down below. Hit the like button because you really like this video and also hit the notification bell so you'll be notified the next time I create a video.